Welcome back, folks, to another edition of Hashtag AskGSM, the weekly Monday Mailbag video where we answer your questions from YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter right here in this video forum. Another great set of questions this week, as I say always. So that being said, let's get right down to it. First question comes from Jose C. from YouTube. Has theme-based pay-per-views hurt the WWE? I heard Labor see a ladder match, especially one for a one-on-one -on -one title match, only in Money in the Bank, which is different, or a TLC match, which is on a pay which is it's its own pay-per-view. Um, every other pay-per-view is either a singles match or a no DQ. We don't really get triple threats or fatal four ways anymore. Why? So a pretty broad question, kind of you know targeting a few different things here. Um, I'll go back to your initial question. Have the third, have the theme-based pay-per-views hurt the WWE? So this was first um, started up back in 2009, 2010 with Breaking Point, Fatal Four Way, TLC, Hell in a Cell. Personally speaking, I'll speak from a biased standpoint here. I don't think they help WWE. I don't enjoy that the theme pay-per-views. It's been said by a lot of people, and I could not agree more, and that when you have theme pay-per-views for matches like Hell in a Cell, like TLC, when those matches eventually happen, they just kind of throw them together. They really have no meaning. Very rarely do the Hell in a Cell matches, the matches that take place within Hell in a Cell, actually stipulate, actually call for the Hell in a Cell stipulation. It really makes no sense. Um, like with The Undertaker and Triple H at WrestleMania 28, that match was in need of a Hell in a Cell. That, that meant something when that match took place with inside um, Hel the Satan structure, set, straight, uh, Satan cell, I guess, or whatever you want to call it. Um, that called for the stipulation. When you put in Randy Orton and Daniel Bryan or CM Punk and Ryback, what does it really mean? You make a list of the top ten. Uh, like you, If you rank every Hell in a Cell match in WWE history, I can guarantee you hardly any, if any, matches that took place within Hell in a Cell within the last five years are going to be on that list because none of them really needed that Hell in a Cell. And yes, it does kind of call for blood. I would like to see more blood in Hell in a Cell. I don't expect it to happen because we live in a PG world and we live in a PG rating environment in today's WWE, so I don't expect it. Uh, but the lack of blood isn't really what's holding it back. It's the fact that we get one at the same time every single year. If they spread it out, like the Elimination Chamber match as well, it's gotten to the point where the winner of the Elimination Chamber has always retained their title. You go back to 2012, 2013, not 2013, but this past year, 2014, 2011. The last time a World Championship changed hands in the Elimination Chamber was in 2010 when Jericho won the World title from The Undertaker inside the Chamber. So it's been almost five years since we saw a title change in that kind of matchup. So Absolutely, I think the theme pay-per-views have hurt the WWE. I don't think they're bringing in any big buy rates. Maybe that's what they thought back in 2009, 2010, but they really haven't seen any spike in numbers, and that's kind of the reason why the pay-per-view business has kind of died out for WWE. It's not completely dead, but that's kind of the reason why they kind of incorporated them into the network. If the pay-per-views were doing well, then they wouldn't have had them on the network. You know what I mean? If, if they were doing huge numbers – then they wouldn't be bringing that to the network. Because they're slowly dying down, they figured, fuck it, let's just put it on the network and take a chance. Um, whether that's paid off or not, it's really hard to say right now. We're still in the infancy of the network. I know it's been six months, but it's still kind of hard to say. Personally, I love it. I love having the pay-per-views on the network. Kind of going off on a tangent here, but um, nevertheless, why don't we get any more triple threats or fatal four ways anymore is what you're asking. Um, I'm not a big fan of multi-man matches. A lot of times they just kind of get lost in the shuffle. Like the Fatal 4-Way match at Battleground, it wasn't terrible when it pitted Cena, Orton, Kane, and Reigns against one another. But it really wasn't all that memorable of a match. If you go to the Fatal 4-Way at NXT TakeOver a couple days ago, and I got a couple of questions about that show, but that was a great freaking Fatal 4-Way matchup because it called for a Fatal 4-Way. All four of those guys deserve a title shot. Roman Reigns to put him in that Fatal 4-Way match at Battleground made no sense, especially considering the fact he was feuding with the Authority. Orton and Kane had seen it a million times. Seeing Cena in a Fatal 4-Way for a championship had seen it a million times. So it really doesn't mean anything anymore. I don't know why we don't get more of those kind of matches, but we just don't. Um, but yeah, to go back to your initial question, yes, theme-based pay-per-views have hurt the WWE, in my opinion. Um, the second question was, was it, is, what is your favorite type of matchup? Um, I don't really have one favorite kind of matchup. I love Money in the Bank every single year. You could say what you will about the concept and it getting stale and old with it being in basically into effect for like 10 years now. But personally speaking here, um, I love Money in the Bank. I look forward to it every single year, both the pay-per-view and match itself. The Royal Rumble match, I don't know how anyone can not love that matchup. Just full of surprises, shockers, a lot of great moments every single year. If you can kind of call that a matchup. I mean, it's technically it's a glorified battle royal, but I love the Royal Rumble nevertheless. Um, and also ladder matches, too. I'm a huge fan of ladder matches. I know they're very rare nowadays. 
and I'm glad too. Um, I know we usually get one of the TLC pay-per-view. We didn't get one last year, but when you space those kind of matches out and save them for big occasions like the one between Jericho and Shawn Michaels, and this was before the TLC pay-per-view went into effect, but the latter match between Michaels and Jericho in 2008, I believe it was, about six years ago, I thought was stellar. So when you save ladder matches, and not Money in the Bank and Royal Rumble because those have their own pay-per-views now, but when you save ladder matches for you know a special occasion, not on a, you know, a specified date every single year, it means more. That kind of ties back into your last question. But moving on, Jared J., his question was, what are your thoughts on Tyler Breeze, Adrian Neville, and Sami Zayn working the main roster tapings in the next month? I think it's great. I thought the showcase of the NXT talents last week on Raw was spectacular. Of course, I'm filming this before this week's Raw, so I'm not sure if they're going to be doing the same thing this week. But um, it's so much better than that 999 crap. And I've said this before, and this is kind of going off on a tangent here. But it's the it's not the price that's a problem with the WWE Network promotion. It's their lack of content. And I'm not complaining. I love the WWE Network. I watch it all the time. All the pay-per-views, the live pay-per-views, the special programming like the Monday Night Wars I love. But they need to add more original content. I know the reality series are a little cost-effective. But that being said, though, it would help if they kind of drove home that aspect of it. All the new content. Plug the shows on Raw. Like with the Monday Night War show, I think Mick Foley noted out. They did promote it before, but they didn't promote Mick Foley's episode when it aired a couple days ago, which I thought was weird. But, um, you know, promote that kind of shit instead of the tagline. I mean, instead of the price. People know the price. They're going to buy it regardless. It's a great price. It's an absolute steal. That's not the problem. The promotion is not the, the problem. The lack of content is. And the promotion that they've been doing for so far for the WWE Network has sucked. And that being said, though, showcasing the NXT talent and kind of going on an incentive, giving viewers an incentive to purchase a network to watch NXT, specifically TakeOver from last week, is a great business strategy. It makes people want to see these up-and-coming stars do what they do best and show the world what they're made of. And that's exactly what they did last week on Raw, and I'm really hoping that's a trend starting forward. Just take out a few minutes of Raw, give them an entrance or two. I know they didn't do that last week, which is understandable, because a lot of people probably didn't know who any of these guys were and they didn't give them a reaction. But that being said, though, you take a few minutes out of Raw every week. You can take a few minutes out of every shitty Bella segment that we're bound to get every single fucking episode of Monday Night Raw and give it to these guys, and they will absolutely make the most of it and give something fans want to see. Um, High-flying action, a lot of excitement, and stuff like that. So I think it's great that Breeze, Neville, and Zayn are going to be working the main roster. Um, as of right now, like I said before, being filmed before Raw, don't know what's on tap for tonight. Nothing's been advertised. But I don't know if they're going to be working the dark matches or what, they, which they have done in the past. Or if they will actually be on the show. And I would love to see them on the show. Um, maybe feuding with each other. Like having matches with each other. Or the main roster talents. Either way, I think it's spectacular. Next question. Also NXT related. Or no, actually. There's another NXT TakeOver question. I don't think it's... I think it came later on. But nevertheless. Um, Andre G. His question was... What are your top five favorite Rey Mysterio feuds? So I don't want to say a feud that I wasn't a fan for, because as I've said in every single frickin' video I put here on the channel, I started watching April 2008, and funnily enough, I, I, I don't think Rey Mysterio has had five feuds in the time I've been a fan, um, which is really mind-boggling to even think about, but he really hasn't, because if you think about it, in the last three years, in the last six years that I've watched wrestling, Rey Mysterio has only been really active for three of them. After 2011, after he lost at WWE title match at Del Rio, um, after SummerSlam 2011, he disappeared for a while. And he's only come back for you know minor stints in the last couple of years. So that being said, I can only think of five feuds that he's had in the last six years. And like I said before, I don't want to say a feud that I wasn't a fan for because although I may have enjoyed his matches with Eddie Guerrero from 2005, it's not the same because I wasn't watching it every week. I wasn't a fan at the time, so it's different. So I only list uh, feuds that he was I was a fan for. Um, that he was around for, including Chris Jericho, number one, easily, from 2009. Those two had spectacular matches in every single pay-per-view they squared off on. Um, Jericho and Mysterio have such great chemistry with one another. Um, that's easily my top number one feud for Rey Mysterio. Um, Cody Rhodes, I thought those two had a very good feud back in 2011, I think it was. Um, not over the IC title, it's kind of like that math thing. Um, he put over Cody Rhodes, not clean, but he did put him over at WrestleMania 27, which was cool. They had a few very good matches in that course of that year of 2011. Him and Del Rio, I thought a great long feud. I think they stretched it from August 2010 to January of 2011, actually. They really stretched it out, which I thought was great. A lot of good matches, a lot of good chemistry. Put, put Del Rio over in a big way to get a big um, 
submission clean victory over Mysterio in his debut matchup. And by the way, these are going like one, two, three, like down the line of one, two, three, four, five. So in at number four, Dolph Ziggler um, and Rey Mysterio, I also thought had a great series of matches over the summer of 2009. It was cut short when Mysterio got suspended um, a couple of years ago. I think it was during the course of the feud um, before they could face off for the IC title at breaking point. But they did have a very good feud before that. And also at number five, two. Um, my least favorite of the five feuds that I know Rey Mysterio took part in in the last couple of years since I've been a fan is one with Batista, which was also in late 2009. It really wasn't much of a feud. The Batista heel turn I thought was very well done. He was a great heel in 09-2010, which he also was when he came back, but that's besides the point. Um, I thought those two had some good promos. Mysterio wasn't much of a promo guy, but they did make the most of it. They did have some decent matches at Survivor Series. They had a good street fight match. Um, I think shortly before TLC, before Batista's World Title Match with Undertaker, but um, those two had a decent feud as well. Maybe Kane, but that was kind of a thrown together feud that should have been more than what it was. But those are my top five favorite Rey Mysterio feuds, and the only feuds that I think Rey Mysterio has taken part in in the last six years since I've been a fan. His second question was, do you think that the divas who can't wrestle should be valets, examples, even Marie, Cameron, etc.? Absolutely. I think leaving those two out of the ring, specifically those two, and Rosa Mendes too. Um, but the thing is, too, I think with Eva, I don't know, I think Rose Mendes is slightly on a better label, on a better level than Eva. It's really hard to say because they're both so comically bad in the ring, on the mic, everything, that I don't even think they could really serve the purpose of a valet because they're just not good at anything they do. I, Eva Marie is some eye candy, so maybe you can do something with that. Rosa Mendes is the perfect example. She didn't have to do anything except for jiggle when she was, um, the, when she served as a valet for uh, Primo and Epico a couple of years ago. And uh, they pulled the plug on that for some reason when they did, started doing the Los Matadores thing, which I think is an absolute train wreck of a gimmick. But when she was serving as a valet for Primo and Epico a couple of years ago, I thought that was a great fit because she can't wrestle for shit. So ser having her serve as a valet for these two great wrestlers I thought was fantastic. And it added, their, added some energy and excitement and some enjoyment to their act, which wouldn't have been there had she not served as their valet. So, yeah, I think that's probably better than having them in the ring. Cameron, I can't stand either. Um, I know Cameron probably took offense. And it's funny because you sent me this question on Facebook as I was watching Total Divas last night. And Cameron, literally at the point in the, in the show when Cameron was talking about how she didn't want to be a valet, she should go back down to NXT. And they said that if there's if she does go back to down to NXT, there's a chance that she won't come back. All this other kind of shit. Maybe that's what they're afraid of and going back down to NXT and kind of getting repackaged and rebranded and hopefully getting better, but Rose Amanda has been in the fucking company for six years and hasn't improved at all. So that being said, she hasn't even won a match, uh, except for one via disqualification. But that being said, though, um, yeah, I think, if anything, I would take them off TV altogether, but if I had to have it my way, if it had to be one of the other wrestlers or valets, I would absolutely make them valets because I think we need more of that in today's wrestling with lack of managers and stuff like that. Paul S., his question was, Goldberg, Roman Reigns, Edge, or Rhino? From these guys, who do you think delivers the best spear move? Um, good question. Edge, I think, as great as Edge is, as big of an edge mark that I am, he's definitely a number four. The spear move, I mean, he made it good, but he never really had the stature to pull off the spear, like, effectively, like a guy, like, he was skinny. Like, for him to take out someone with a spear was comical. I mean, like I said, he mastered it over time. Same thing with Christian. They execute good spears, but it doesn't really fit their body type, like a guy playing football or something like that. At least with Rhino, Roman Reigns, and Goldberg, it's believable. Rhino hit the hell of a spear. I think his spear is very underrated. Roman Reigns is pulling spears out of nowhere, which is something that Rhino, I think, could never do. Rhino hit the best spears when he was setting it up. Roman Reigns hits fucking amazing spears when they're out of nowhere. So I think him and Goldberg are really up there, but I think you got to give it to Goldberg because even though he didn't do his out of nowhere all the time, he had such a powerful spear, and it was so believable too because he's a former athlete. He's a former football player like Roman Reigns, but like the spear through the, the chamber wall and the chamber glass, the plexiglass, whatever, in the elimination chamber, that was an amazing spear. Um, they're just so believable. Like you feel hurt just watching him execute it because he does it so um, – he executes it so greatly so believably that it feels like you are getting hurt just watching him hurt somebody else with it. So I, I think I would have to rank Goldberg up there. Roman Reigns is slowly getting up there. Um, I know Roman Reigns, say what you will about his uh, about his move set and whatever else, and that he has a lack of move, five moves to do him, all that other bullshit. But that being said, he cuts an amazing spear, executes an amazing spear. Um, it's right up there with Goldberg's, but I would have to rank Goldberg at number one. 
Um, up oh, next, or he's got a couple of questions. His second question was, oh, and by the way, Paul S., his, question, his uh, birthday was yesterday as well as they filmed this, so happy birthday to him. Happy belated birthday, Paul. So his second question was, do you think that too much reality TV is somewhat killing the reality era of the WWE? Um, I wouldn't really say it's killing it. I mean, I like the brand. I like the term of the reality era. Punk was calling it the reality era years ago when he started doing the Money the Bank thing, the whole Summer of Punk thing in 2011. That's really when it started started to get started, technically. I know Triple A started calling it the reality era earlier this year on the road to WrestleMania. And I don't know if that's what you can call it. We can't really say that we're living in a new era. Like, you don't break things up into eras until, like, years down the line. So it's really hard to say. And I know I'm guilty of this. But you can't really say we're entering a new era because you can't really say that until, like, in retrospect. It's a little different. But even still, though, um, I don't, I wouldn't say that too much reality TV is killing the reality era, if only because shows like Total Divas, I think, are helping, um, like the Divas division and stuff like that. I don't think it's hurting WWE TV. If anything, it's helping it and giving them more exposure and stuff like that. I can't really see other too much reality TV in what you're talking about. Maybe stuff on the network, like Legends House, I don't think is at all killing the reality era. Uh, maybe breaking kayfabe is not really breaking the reality era of WWE, but it's kind of hurting wrestling as a whole. Um, when you kind of do stupid, illogical shit that exposes the in and outs of the business, that's kind of killing the business as a whole, not really this reality era that we're living in. Um, but I can't really answer that question. I don't think it's hurting WWE, if that's what you're asking, like shows like Total Divas. If anything, in my opinion, I think it's helping, giving them more exposure. Um, granted, whether it be good or bad, like with the whole Nikki Bella Breeze storyline, that's as a result of Total Divas. But in other ways, they are getting more TV time and stuff like that, so that's good for them. They're having people – like I, I know of several people. I, know, I know of several instances where people have only watched Total Divas and got into watching Raw every week because of Total Divas. So in that way, I think it has helped the business or helped WWE specifically in this reality era. His next question was, um, CM Punk skates with the WWE's Aiken of the Ultimate Warriors before lawsuits, etc. When do you think these two, Punk and the WWE, will make amends so hell can freeze over? I heard someone else make that comparison a couple days ago, and I couldn't agree more. Um, I think it's a great comparison between CM Punk and Ultimate Warrior, especially since CM Punk is such – he idolizes the Ultimate Warrior, or at least is a very big fan of him. I know they respect one another. They traded Twitter um, conversations a couple of years ago. CM Punk on his DVD talked about it. I don't know. He hasn't spoken to Warrior since his death because Punk was not in the WWE when Warrior returned. But um, nevertheless, I do think that's a very valid comparison. Ultimate Warrior was gone from WWE for 18 years, and the only reason why he came back was not because of Vince McMahon, was because of Triple H. And in this case with CM Punk, it's a little different if only because I don't know if CM Punk's problem is with Vince and Triple H or one or the other or whoever else. But from what I've heard, and like I've said before, Triple H is not confident on this. Vince McMahon, for the most part, is not really confident on this. Neither has CM Punk, so we, no one really knows what the true story is as of right now. But, I, like with the Ultimate Warrior, he wasn't on good terms with Vince, but he made amends with Triple H and the WWE through the game. With CM Punk, I don't think he's on good terms with either Triple H or Vince McMahon, so it makes it a little bit harder. And he's only been gone for, what, six months at this point? Uh, seven, eight months since the start of the year? I still to this day say that he will be back, whether it might not even be in an in-ring role. I think he might be back in a Hall of Fame induction down the line. I think he will be back at some point, whether it be as a wrestler or not. I do think everyone comes back eventually. You know, everyone makes amends. You know, time heals all wounds, all those kind of cliches. I do think CM Punk will be back at some point. When? I have absolutely no idea. It's not going to be next month, maybe not even next year. You never know. I think it could take years, for all we know. I mean, I don't want to say that because I'm a big CM Punk fan. I want to see him back in WWE, but um, I don't expect him to be back anytime soon. I'll say that much. If that's what you're asking, like when should we expect for them to make amends so Hell can freeze over, as he said, um, I don't see it happening anytime soon. With the whole CM Punk lawsuit, that's another um, bad aspect of their current relationship. I guess it's a, another detail as to whether, you know, as to how their current relationship is, which I. Assuming it's not good, obviously, if CM Punk is telling WWE to take all his merch off, so all the lawsuits and shit like that, using his likeness, and all that kind of stuff. So um, the bottom line, in my personal opinion anyway, is that I don't think CM Punk will be back anytime soon, but he will be back at some point. It may not be next month, it might not be next year, it might not be within the next 10 years, but CM Punk, as I've said since the start, will be back. Next question, and your fourth and final question. Um, now that they've dropped the titles to the Lucha Dragons... Do you see the Ascension going to the main roster now? Yes, I do. They worked the main roster match. 
And it wasn't more so of a main roster debut. It was more of a showcase for NXT TakeOver um, and promoting that show. But um, when they beat the Los Matadores on last week's episode of Main Event. But um, I do think the Ascension or our main roster ready. Connor O'Brien or Connor or whatever you want to call him. He's been in NXT for the last two years now. Since NXT first got started at Full Sail. He's been there doing the Ascension gimmick ever since. I know Victor or uh, whatever his name is has been doing the gimmick part of the Ascension for only a couple of months now or at least for the last year or so, but the Ascension has been NXT for far too long, and if they're going to be doing the squash matches in NXT, or on the main roster like they have been in NXT, then so be it, but they just got to get them out of NXT, because they've been doing the same shit for the last two years now, and this is coming from an Ascension fan, um, I'm just not a fan of all the squash matches they do every single fucking week, I mean, at least give them some credible opponents, not the same jobbers every single week, it gets old after a month, much less two years, you know what I mean? But um, absolutely, I do think the Ascension are main roster ready, and they should be called up any time now. And hopefully they can kick off a feud with the Usos over the WWE Tag Team titles, and then that could be a great feud over those straps. Um, Justin G, his question was, can you see the Usos breaking up at any point and feuding? Um, no, I don't think so. I've been asked this question before, and I talked about it on my Facebook page a couple of months or a couple of weeks ago. Now, I don't think with the Usos, like with the Bella Twins, it's different, because although they do have alternate, you know, they do have very differing, Images now very different uh, uh, looks than they did a couple of years ago, and I couldn't have ta told them apart at all. Um, they're very much different now. They have their own personalities. Total Divas has helped them with that. And even I think Jimmy Uso is, of course, on Total Divas as well. So you can kind of incorporate that into that. But um, you can't tell them apart for anything. I mean, it's been four fucking years, and I still can't tell them apart. I know one of them has a tattoo, but it's still Jimmy J. The names are so similar. It's so confusing to me personally. I know I'm not the only one. But it's so pathetic that it's been four years and I still can't even tell them apart. But no, I don't think either guy has a singles feature whatsoever. I think they're one of those tag teams that is much better off as a tag team and not as singles competitors. Because neither one is better than the other in terms of anything. They're exactly the same. Looks in the ring, mic skills are exactly the same. So there's really no point in breaking them up and making them single stars. And then there's really no money in that is all, at all. They're one of those long-term tag teams. Like, not really the Hardys. And I don't think that's a good comparison. Um, that can stick together for a very long time without breaking up because they're brothers and they're really, there really is nothing for them as singles competitors. Um, the second question was, do you have any WWE music on your iPod? Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I don't have my phone on me. I think it's back here, but probably like two-thirds of it is made up of like theme music and shit. Um, I can't mm, – let's see if I can make it up right now. No, I can't pull it up right now, but at least like 100 or – 150 entrance music on my on my on my iPod. Not current themes, but you know, like all time themes and shit like that. And whatever isn't entrance themes is, uh, you know, like pay per view themes and shit like that, and all that kind of stuff. But uh, yes, a majority of my iPod is made up of, of theme music and shit like that. But the third question was, which promotion do you think had more interesting characters of this bunch, um, with TNA, Relic, Black Rain, Abyss, or Judas Messiah, or the WWE, um, 1999 Viscera, Mordecai, Gangrel, and Medion? Um, I, I, it's, that's a good question. Um, of those, some people, I don't even know half the guys who these were like relic. I don't know who that is. And, um, Medion, I don't know who that is. Maybe that was an old school nineties character. I mean, I have no idea to be quite honest with you. Black rain. I know was gold dust in TNA a number of years ago when he had that brief stint, which was terrible. I think that got the award from some wrestling site as one of the worst gimmicks of the year. Um, abyss and Judas Messiah, I think are both great gimmicks. Abyss has really died down. But it's a great gimmick. A lot of people will say it's a ripoff of um, Kane or whatever, Mankind, or kind of a uh, the love child of both. Judas and Sias, I think, is very underrated, um, as well as – I'm thinking of the manager. I can't think of his name off, off the top of my head. Um, Sinister Minister, I think, is great as well. He's not on there, but I think he was great in TNA, who has never worked for WWE, surprisingly. But um, I'm going to have to go with WWE on this one. And not just because I'm a bigger fan of WWE than I am of TNA, but I think of the characters that you named, the Sierra had uh, – some potential in 1999. I mean, he was an entertaining character. He might not have been world champion material, but he was entertaining nevertheless. Mordecai was a very interesting gimmick. I mean, the word you used was interesting. So Mordecai was interesting. Um, so I would go with Mordecai there. The Kevin Thorne, the future Kevin Thorne. Gangrel, um, very notable character. Not really much n more known for anything other than his entrance music, but still uh, an interesting character nevertheless. And Medion, like I said before, I have no idea what that is. So I'm going to have to go with WWE in this case with Basira, Mordecai, Gangrel, and Midian. Uh, now time for the Twitter questions. At Cody Curlier 12 his question was, how would you rank NXT TakeOver Fatal 4-Way this past Thursday compared to the last two NXT Live specials? 
Um, I know I'm not the only one who has said this, but I think that the TakeOver Fatal 4-Way Special from this past Thursday was the worst of the three, but even that sounds harsh. But it really is a testament to how great the last two were. I would put TakeOver 1 at number 1, Arrival 2, and then TakeOver 2 at number 3. But all three of them were so great that it's really hard to rank all three of them. Um, TakeOver 4, I think the next one, or the next question I got was in terms of the main event, so I'll get to that in a second. But overall, I thought NXT TakeOver Fatal 4-Way was fantastic. I really, really enjoyed it from start to finish. The main event was spectacular. That's about the next, that's, that's it's in regards to the next question, so I'll get to that in a minute. Um, the Divas match was very, very good as well. So, and the NXT Tag Team title match, the opener, was enjoyable. Indeed. So, yeah, I really enjoyed the show overall, and I thought it was great. Not as great as the last two specials, but awesome nevertheless. Um, at D-A-J-O-S-C-11, his question was, Out of the four in the NXT TakeOver main event, which one do you think will be the most successful when they get called up? Great question. Um, Tyson Kidd is already kind of already on the main roster technically, so not really him. I know he has a lot of untapped potential, but I just really can't see WWE doing more with him outside of um, I, I think his place is in NXT as, you know, helping the younger talents. I think he's great, but his role, his place is in NXT. He's been doing the best work of his career down there. Um, Tyler Breeze, if he evolves a bit more, I can see him getting some success in the main roster, but in the current gimmick, probably not. It really comes down to Adrian Neville and Sami Zayn. Adrian Neville, some would argue, has a better move set. He's more exciting in the ring, hence why they showcased him more in the tag team match last week. And he has the better finishing maneuver, stuff like that, but... And I know it's not always about the size like with Daniel Bryan shit like that, but Adrian Neville doesn't really have the look or the mic skills. And I know he can you can give a mouthpiece, and I'm not saying he won't be successful. I just don't think he will be. Um, and I would love to see them prove me wrong and actually utilize him to his full potential. But I just see him being like the next Evan Bourne because he's got a great finishing maneuver in WWE. I mean, he's going to be a great act, you know, a great hand in the main roster. But I'm not saying he'll be a jobber, but I just he's one of those people I just can't see getting beyond a certain level. Sami Zayn, he can kind of get over with his Olay chance. He's got the mic skills. He's got the full pack. He's got the look. Like a Daniel Bryan kind of guy who I never thought would be world champion. So maybe I'm saying the same thing with Adrian Neville there. But with Sami Zayn, I could definitely see making it to a much bigger level than um, Adrian Neville. And he's not much taller than Adrian Neville, but Adrian Neville just doesn't have the look, the size, the mic skills, whatever. It's not his fault. I just don't see WWE utilizing him as a star. And I know they gave him the NXT title, but... You look at Big E, I know they gave him the IC title too after he got called up, but what are they doing with him now? So just because they have the NXT title doesn't mean they're always going to be pushed properly. But uh, nevertheless, I think Sami Zayn of the four in the NXT TakeOver main event will be the most successful. Um, at Tony Kegger, his question was, which night of champions match are you most excited about? A lot of them, actually. I'm looking forward to Jericho and Orton with history together dating back to 2010, so that should be a great, very well-wrestled matchup. Cesaro and Sheamus have had great matches in the past. Go back and check out their match from Payback on the network for only $9.99. Um, I expect them to have another great match in Out of Champions. The Usos and the Dust Brothers, Goldust and Stardust, I think could have another great match if they have great chemistry in the ring as well. And even Cena and Brock Lesnar, I'm interested to see what they're going to be doing with them and how they change up the matchup from their SummerSlam contest. Will it be more similar to their Extreme Rules matchup from a couple years ago? I'm very excited for all the matches on the card, but uh, of those, of all the matches currently announced, I'm excited for those four the most. I'm kind of wrapping up here. Um, at Sal D'Angelo Jr., his question was, if Brock Lesnar never left for UFC and The Rock never left for the movies, how would things be different through all those years? Triple H probably wouldn't have dominated the Attitude Era and wouldn't have been world champion for as long as he was. Um, the Rock left in 02, so, and he would have been on Raw maybe a little bit more, so maybe Triple H, like I said, would not have dominated Raw. Um, and then Lesnar left in 04. So had Lesnar not left in 04, would they have pushed Cena to the top? It's really hard to say. Maybe not. Maybe. Um, same thing with Batista. Would they have pushed him as hard as they did to kind of replace that Brock Lesnar role? Probably not. I mean, they tried to push Randy Orton and it failed when they gave him the world title and took it off him in a month. I don't think he was ready for it at that point. But um, it's really hard to say. I think I think the most notable thing I could say when it comes to this question is that I don't think either Cena or Batista would have been pushed. They did have plans for them, obviously, but I don't know if they would have become as big of stars had Brock Le Lesnar not left in 2004. I, know, I don't know how much longer Rock would have been able to do it in 2002, but I know Lesnar could have gone a few more years easily. Um, he could have had um, – he could have affected the rises of Cena and Batista in those respective years. At Eli, the big guy, his question was, with his fast pace and technical style – you see Adrian Neville being our generations of dynamite kid. Absolutely. I heard someone else made that comparison a couple days ago as well. Um, and I absolutely agree. I think he could be. 
And I don't think, like I said before, I don't see him getting beyond a certain level. But he's so talented. He's so entertaining to watch in the ring that I do think he can get success on the main roster. And just kind of wrapping up here, next question from at Jared Bodel. His question was, do you think NXT is a better wrestling show overall than Raw and SmackDown? Absolutely. I think that goes without saying. Um, I'm definitely more entertained by NXT more often than not than Raw or SmackDown. And it's, I mean, it's a hard comparison to make. Is Raw's three hours, NXT is one. And I've got a question before whether they should make NXT longer. No, they should not. Um, I think the way it is now I think is good. But NXT I definitely think is a better wrestling show, which is a lot less segments and shitty comedy. They've only got two people writing it, whereas in the WWE creative team for the main roster, they've got 30 fucking people. So yes, I do think NXT is a better wrestling show than Raw or SmackDown. Then anyone not watching it is out of their mind. So check it out immediately. But with all that being said, thanks for sending in the question, folks. Always appreciate it. If you want to send in a question, you can either leave a comment down below. You can uh, find me on Facebook at Graham Jason Matthews. Leave a comment on the wall. Or find me on Twitter and, and on Twitter and tweet me at WrestleRant with the hashtag AskTSM. So with that being said, all support is greatly appreciated. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. I'll catch you guys next week. And I'm Graham Jason Matthews, and I'll catch you guys then.